Hello, I'm Chris Grant, the owner and funeral director of McDermott's Funeral and Cremation Service. And this video is going to be dealing with correctly filling out our cremation authorization and order for disposition form. Looks something like this. This is probably the most important form that we'll be filling out with regard to cremation as it authorizes the cremation to take place and tells us what the disposition or what we're doing with the cremated remains uh, as far as delivering them or turning them over or mailing them and so on. Um, I do recommend reading through the entire document. It is a three page document, even though we only need pages one and three back uh, from the family. But it, it is a legal document, so I would recommend reading through the whole thing uh, as you're filling it out. I'm only going to be going over the parts that you need to actually fill in so that you know you're filling it in correctly. Um, and again, as always, if you have any questions while filling it out, you can always reach out to us at 702-431-6161 um, and we can assist you with going through the, the, the paperwork. So on page one of the cremation authorization and order for disposition, uh, fairly simple, starts with name of deceased. We usually do last name first, first name last, and then again, if it's uh, a male, junior, senior, first, second, third, whatever the case may be. Uh, sex, male or female, date of birth, date of death, funeral establishment representative in charge will usually be me. Um, two questions that the state requires. To the best of your knowledge, was death due to a communicable or otherwise dangerous disease? Uh, again, it's to the best of your knowledge. So you would initial either next to yes, if it was due to uh, COVID or Ebola or um, meningitis, something like that, or no, if it was not. And are you aware of any objection to cremation by any person who has a right to control the disposition of remains? Again, initial either next to yes or no. If you're the spouse of this person who's deceased, the only person that can control the right of disposition is you, so unless you object to yourself, um, you would put no. Uh, this falls more into if the next of kin is the adult children or um, parents or siblings where there could be multiple next of kin. Um, if there's four or five next of kin or one or two object, then you would put yes, and again, we would deal with that at that point. If everybody's on board, you would, you would initial next to no. Pacemakers and radioactive implants, anything that has that radioactive battery, like a pacemaker or defibrillator, that battery has to be removed before the cremation can take place. It will explode uh, and can do damage to my crematory operator, my crematory equipment, and so on. Um, so the first one says the decedent's remains do not contain a pacemaker, radioactive implant, or other device that could be harmful to the crematory. The decedent's remains are safe to cremate. So if they have nothing implanted that's got that battery, again, an artificial knee, artificial hip, that, that's fine. But if it has that bat, if it does not have that battery, I should say, then you would just initial here. If they do have a pacemaker or defibrillator or something that has that battery, then you'd put NA for not applicable here, and then you'd move on to number two. Uh, number two is uh, you, where you, you would check next to pacemaker or defibrillator, or if there's something else, you'd put other and fill in what that other is and initial next to that. Uh, again, if you initial that they're safe, then on this line you can put NA. Uh, under cremation process where it says casket, cremation, container, urn selected. Uh, description of casket or container. It says alternative. Most of our cremations uh, are done in what's called an alternative container. It's essentially a cardboard casket. Uh, we cannot cremate someone without some sort of a rigid container for the safety of my crematory operator and for the dignity of the person being uh, cremated. So if you have purchased or are going to purchase or provide to us a cremation casket, you can put other and then fill in a description of the casket you chose. Otherwise, you would just circle altern alternative. Description of urn selected. Uh, plastic, again, is the basic plastic container that we provide. It is suitable for transport. It is suitable for placement in the cemetery. It is suitable for you to be scattering the remains. It's just not a decorative container at all. So if you have purchased or are going to be providing to us a more decorative container or containers, you can circle other and put a description of those containers uh, or that container, whatever the case may be. 
Witness cremations, uh, again, you would circle um, yes or no, where it says, are there any people who wish to witness the casket or container being placed in the cremation chamber? Circle yes or no. If yes, please provide the names of those individuals who wish to witness. Uh, our witness cremations um, are no more than 10 people for no more than 30 minutes. And yes, you would put the names, uh, name or names of the people that are going to attend. It's not something I recommend, um, but uh, we do offer it. There's no additional charge for it if you're doing uh, one of our concierge packages or above, like traditional or memorial. Um, however, like I said, it is seeing that person as they were, no embalming, no cosmetics, no anything, uh, just before they're cremated. So keep that in mind if this is something you want to do. We will accommodate it, but again, we, we, we recommend against it. Page two is mostly terms and definitions, uh, what they say, legalese. Um, caskets, containers, a description of what those are. Urns, temporary containers, again, we went over that. Disclosures, warranties, and permissions, um, basically saying that by signing this document, what you understand uh, this document to mean and to, to um, uh, be for. An indemnity clause, which essentially says that if you fill this out fraudulently, um, you say that you're the wife and you are divorced or you never actually got married. Nevada doesn't recognize common law. Um, but you put yourself down as the wife and you fill out everything as the wife. If that is uh, not the case, you are committing fraud. We are not. And you would be uh, liable. Uh, we would not. On page three, it starts at the top with I, we hereby certify that the decedent left the following survivors at law. Um, you don't have to fill this whole thing out. It's whatever applies. So if there's a spouse, you put yes, the name of the spouse, that's it. If there's no spouse, again, you'd check no, and then it goes to adult children. If there are adult children over the age of 18, not minors, then you would put yes, how many there are and their names. Um, if there are no uh, no spouse, no adult children, again, you'd check no, then it goes to surviving parents. If there are surviving parents, yes, how many and their names. If there's no surviving parents, then it goes to siblings. Yes or no, how many and their names. If there's no spouse, if there's no children, if there's no parents, if there's no siblings, that's when we get to other, and then that's going to be up to um, basically my discretion as far as who that other is. If it's a power of attorney, with uh, it can supply those documents saying that that power of attorney is valid. Um, anybody getting a power of attorney, you want to get a durable power of attorney that has verbiage that says that this power of attorney goes on in perpetuity does not end at the person's death, like a general power of attorney or a power of attorney just for health care or just for financial. It has to be something that specifically spells out that this goes on after my death, that this is to take care of my cremation or funeral arrangements. Some kind of verbiage has to be in there for us to accept a uh, power of attorney document. Um, if there's no power of attorney and there's no spouse, children, parents, siblings, then we kind of get into what what is there? Maybe there's only a, a, a grandson, a nephew, a niece. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll deal with that from there. But this is the main hierarchy of who can authorize a cremation. Um, scanning down a little bit further under where it says disposition of cremated remains. On the left, the first space that says initial um, is next to a um, paragraph or a sentence that says, I understand that in the event the cremated remains have not been permanently interred or picked up by me or my designated representative within two years from the date of cremation, I hereby authorize the funeral establishment to lawfully dispose of cremated remains. So if for some reason you don't pick up, if for some reason we can't reach you to deliver, if you don't give us any instructions on where to take the remains, we will hold them for up to two years. We'd, we'd, we would rather not, but we will. Um, at the end of those two years, we can legally dispose of them however we see fit. So um, most of our dispositions are scatters up at Mount Charleston. We just kind of go off the beaten path and scatter the remains. Um, we try not to do that. You know, we make every effort to contact the family to get these released, um, but unfortunately, after a couple of years, storage can become an issue, and we are then legally able to dispose of them however however we deem necessary. Uh, 
as long as we're, it's still in a dignified manner. So we scattered them up in Mount Charleston. Uh, the next initial underneath where it says, I hereby direct and authorize the release slash delivery or shipment of said cremated remains. You're going to initial one of these. The first one is if we are releasing locally. So if somebody's going to be picking up the remains or if we are delivering them to you or to someone else, um, you would initial that first space. And then where it says release the said cremated remains to the name or names of who you're authorizing us to release to. We'll get to the address a little bit later, but this is just for their names. If instead, or where it says, sorry, for the purpose of to keep. What you're doing with the remains once we release them to you is, is really none of our concern. The second initial deliver to, if we're delivering to a cemetery for you or on your behalf instead, um, you would put the name of the cemetery um, and uh, you would want to make sure that you've already dealt with the cemetery. Uh, you, we, we don't just show up unannounced because we will contact the cemetery and coordinate the delivery, but Every once in a while we show up and the cemetery doesn't know what we're talking about. So you want to make sure you have made arrangements with that cemetery to accept your loved one's remains um, before we get to the delivery portion of it. If we are mailing the remains, we mail everything through the U.S. Postal Service express mail only and only within the um, continental U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, or Puerto Rico. Um, if we are mailing them, you would initial in the third space and then where it says ship to the name, the address, the mailing address, the phone number of who we're sending them to, and then an email for us to attach the label. That can be yours or it can be the person we're shipping them to. It's just so you get updates of the shipping. And again, to read through this uh, paragraph, because a lot of people just skip over and fill it in. I appoint the funeral establishment my agent to make shipment of said remains via U.S. Postage Mail Express or scheduled air shipment, proper container or urn required by company. I am aware that the funeral establishment services have been fully completed when the cremated remains leave the funeral establishment and that funeral establishment is only acting as my agent for my accommodation in carrying out these instructions. I understand that the funeral establishment assumes no responsibility after delivery to the post office common carrier agent. We have no control over the U.S. Postal Service. We have no control over that mail carrier and how they handle these remains. We wrap them per their, their requirements. They're wrapped and put into boxes that say cremated remains and fragile and handled with care and are, are taped and, and secured in a certain way. If they arrive to you later than they're supposed to, if they arrive and the box has been crushed, if they arrive and it looks like it's been dropped and their urn inside is damaged, we assume no responsibility for that. When we put it into the packaging, we bubble wrap it, we use uh, packing peanuts or whatever the case may be, depending on the urn, that'll determine the size of the box or what have you. We hand deliver that to the postal service, to the post office here locally. Once we've done that, that is the end of our extent of uh, what our job description is. I cannot control the Postal Service being delayed. I cannot control them not arriving on the day or time that they have allotted. And I certainly cannot control if the mail carrier mishandles those remains. I hope they don't. It seldom ever happens. But every once in a while, we get a call from a family that's very upset and expecting us to replace a four or $500 urn or that's very distraught because the, the packaging looks like it's been crushed or dropped or who knows what. And uh, in some cases, we've even had calls saying that some of the remains may have leaked out. It's a terrible thing and we secure everything the best we can. But if that mail carrier has not done their job, that unfortunately is not our responsibility. Uh, we are just taking them to the post office on your behalf once they are at the post office and in the postal services care. There, it's out of our control at that point. The next section, signature, uh, oh, sorry, there's another initial spot if we're doing something other than that, like um, if we're going to be holding them or if we're going to be scattering them for you, uh, if you'd rather we scatter them, let us know in advance, and you can put on there that you want us to scatter and where to scatter them, that kind of thing. Signature of authorizing agent or agents, um, where it says executed at, this is the time, date, month and year that you're actually signing this form. So executed at the time, this first, second, third, whatever date, uh, day of 
August, September, whatever, uh, 2020 20 or 21, whatever year it is. The, there are three signature spaces here. Um, because you're not signing in front of me, the funeral director, the first signature space is for the next of kin or the authorizing agent, the power of attorney or spouse or whatever that may be. Their printed name, their signature, their relationship to the deceased, their phone number, and their address. The other two signatures are for any two people over the age of 18. They can be family, friends, coworker, neighbors, whatever, to sign as witnesses to your signature. They don't have to fill out all their information, but they would need, at least need to print their name, sign their name, and for wit relationship, they could put witness number one and witness number two. That's fine by us. Signature of funeral establishment, that's only if you were signing something in front of us and then we wouldn't be doing this video. Uh, deceased name, again, last name first, first name last, and the cremation identification number. When we pick anyone up, we place an engraved stainless steel coin about the size of a quarter on their ankle. It's engraved with McDermott's and then um, a number. Right now we're on four digit numbers, but obviously that will change to five and six and so on. That number, we will give you that number over the phone if you request it. We will be putting it on all the paperwork. If you're getting the basic plastic container delivered to you, it will be on there. That number that we assign is never used again. It stays with that person throughout this entire process. It'll go on most of their paperwork. When we deliver the remains back to you or to the cemetery or to whoever you instruct us to take them to, inside that basic container or the urn you provide, attached to the bag that holds the remains will be that coin with that same number on it, letting you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that those remains are of that decedent. Now there's only one coin per decedent. So if you've ordered multiple urns, one of the urns, usually the main large urn, uh, or the urn that's going to the legal next of kin is the one that we attach that tag to. Um, there's not multiple tags for obvious reasons, but that is how we keep track of everybody um, and that is how we in, in assure you that those remains we're giving you are your loved one's remains. And that concludes our cremation authorization and order for disposition form. As always, as I mentioned before, if you have any questions while you're filling these out, don't guess, don't leave things blank because we'll think you missed something. Give us a call, 702-431-6161 anytime 24 7 and either myself or one of my staff members will be able to talk you through step by step what needs to be filled out and how to do it correctly thank you